Hello, everyone. Uh, Mike Good, founder of Togetherness, an online resource helping Alzheimer's and dementia caregivers succeed. Thank you for tuning in live, or maybe you're going to watch the replay later. I'm so glad you're here. Because today I'm talking about an important topic that I feel isn't discussed enough, and I think you're going to find it incredibly valuable with strategies you can start implementing immediately. It's my first time doing Facebook Live, and I'm happy you're here, so we're taking a little bit of a casual approach. Our focus is to today is to discuss whether your home is contributing to undesirable behaviors related to dementia and undermining your actions as a caregiver. And it might even be possibly speeding up the decline. So I look forward to exploring this topic with you. I know it's the hardest thing ever, and, and no one ever argues with me when I say caring for a person with Alzheimer's or other dementia is possibly the most strenuous, most complicated, most trying situation a person can find themselves in. So I'm never, never am I just trying to, to say it's, anything's going to be easy, because it's definitely going to take work. But, but um, I truly believe that if we work on it and we put strategies in place, we can can listen, ease the ease the stress. Hi, Chris. Thank you. I'm happy you're here. Hi, Karma. Karma. Happy to see you're here too. Our behavior. So our loved ones. You know, with this, with Alzheimer's, everybody has a risk of decline, right? Our loved ones' disease progresses. Our relationship declines. Our health declines, and that's that includes the entire family. I always say it's the family with Alzheimer's, not just the person with Alzheimer's, because it truly affects everybody. And, and it's our goal to turn the trials and struggles into more happy, enriching, and fulfilling times. Now, our behavior, it's typically a result of our environment or the people around us. And for people with dementia, whether it's Alzheimer's disease or another type of cognitive impairment, Impairment, it's no different. However, as you know, the way their brains process sensory input, it's not within their control anymore. And homes, and just in general, they don't meet our needs, especially when we have age-related challenges. And if you're over 40, then you've probably already seen this on a small level. Um, maybe your eyes of your eyesight starting to decline. You need stronger lighting in the house. It's harder to reach things on shelves. Sometimes things just become a little more frustrating in our home. And then when you, you realize that somebody has unique challenges, whether it's Alzheimer's or a, a mobility issue or something, it just magnifies everything. It creates frustrations. It results in negative emotions and um, oftentimes negative behaviors. Um, and so we want to work to try that. Hi, Charlotte. Thanks for being here. So as we try to keep our loved ones safe in the home, which is obviously our highest priority, we often start to confine them and we take away their independence. And often this leads to, you know, this can lead to boredom, anger, depression, and un other undesirable behaviors. In fact, I've seen several papers written how boredom is possibly the, you know, the number one cause of a lot of the undesirable behaviors and um, and when a person once a person is exhibiting an undesirable behavior or emotion it takes a great amount of empathy and skill to alleviate the situation and with over 80 percent of people with dementia being cared for in their homes that's just something that's most people don't really have. I mean, we're not trained to be caregivers. Some people are, don't even have the, the, the nurturing gene, if you will. Um, it's not something, you know, some people have never had children, so they don't really understand how to care for somebody. And so that empathy is, is there, and, and it becomes a very frustrating situation for all. Hi, Tina. Thanks for joining us. Um, and if anyone has questions, I'll be sure to try to be checking the chat. So. Um, so, you know, so caregivers, care partners, we, you know, we don't all have this ability or the patience. It's something that takes a lot of work. It takes a lot of support from others to help us get to. So as a result, instead of helping the person work through the behavior, oftentimes an all or nothing approach to care is implemented. You know, you can't do that. You can't go there. You have to stop. 
And when we infringe on somebody's will to do something, or we treat them in a condescending manner, it only escalates the issues, and it, it really it's not good for anybody. And um, and again, I'm you know never never assume, never believe that I'm saying any of this is easy because I know it's hard and and we fail on a daily basis, but we rebound and we do try to do better the next day. And um, other thing is other times to avoid these behaviors and to compensate for our inability to work through the behavior. We turn to antipsychotic medications, and in fact, antipsychotics are not really aren't should not never be the first first line of defense or not defense the first line of treatment, if you will. In fact, antipsychotics are off-label medications. They're not they've never been tested on people with cognitive impairments of dementia and and Alzheimer's. Um, so and and they're always supposed to be used on a temporary basis. Not not long, not on a daily basis, and by no means for a long term, as they often are inappropriately. And of course, there's numerous side effects. And the FDA in 2005 issued a warning that people with dementia who are on these medications face an increased risk of death of 1.6 to 1.7 times greater than those on a placebo. So we really, the point is, we really want to avoid the all-or-nothing approach that that takes away somebody's independence and their will, and we want to avoid the use of um, antipsychotics when possible. So if, however, so if the undesirable and sometimes aggressive behavior it can be avoided in the first place, that's what we want. We want to, we want to eliminate the, or avoid these behaviors before they ever happen so that we can have a loving, nurturing relationship with our loved one, so their well-being can be protected, so we can keep them engaged, so we can slow the decline. I, I, I really think that we are in control to some degree, not always, of course, the, 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 the rate of decline and, and that person's happiness. And if we do this, everyone will have a more pleasant interaction Medications can be minimized, and that well-being is maximized not only for the person with Alzheimer's or dementia, but for the entire family. Hi, hey, Kim. Nice to see you here. I haven't talked to you in a while. Um, so how do we avoid the emotions or the behaviors? What do we do? As mentioned, the environment is really what often is what causes anyone's emotions or reactions to things. It's really people around you can easily upset you, annoy you. You know, people with dementia are no different. The, the environment affects them in the same ways. They're just not able always to communicate it or control their reactions to it the way we should. And, and again, also when we, when we lash out or whatever at our environment, we're oftentimes forgiven. However, the person with dementia is labeled as a, a bad egg, if you will, and and you know once that label has been put on them, um, it's just it's a disrespectful approach to care, and it, we really need to turn that around. So, so again, typically it's something in the vi environment that's triggered the behavior. You know, again, such as you're preventing them from doing something, then you have to you know walk, put yourself in their shoes. How would you feel if someone was preventing you from doing something? You know, they're frustrated. They can't find something. How many times have you lost something in the home and, and you just you're, you get at your wits end because it's like you're really frustrated. I, I lost something two weeks ago and I, I didn't even need to have it. It was like an old pair of sunglasses. That, and, and I spent two hours searching for them at, for no reason, really. And it just created frustration in me and... Um, and, and unnecessarily, and you know, I may even have taken a little bit out on my wife when she was getting on me. So, you know, but but you know, I, it's acceptable for me, but not for the person with Alzheimer's. No, that's not right. So, also, you know, seeing things something outside. You know, they, we get excited. We want to go investigate. Um, we want to explore. We we want to get some fresh air. Um, sometimes it's you know a picture of the family um, who they no longer recognize. You know, many of you may be aware that people with with cognitive decline see themselves at a much younger age 
um, maybe maybe in their 20s or something. And for a lot of the older adults, pictures were in black and white and the dress and stuff, the way we dress was totally different. So when they see pictures on the table that are colorful and beautiful and of themselves in their 60s or 70s and they don't recognize it, they see them as strangers and they don't feel like they're at home necessarily. So then, of course, they're like, I want to go home. So things like that. Another example of of something that, you know, might, might be like a trigger or something um, is someone constantly want to go, go and go to the bathroom. I read about one family that due to their mom's incontinence issues, they placed a portable commode right in eyesight in the living room for her so that she could quickly find it and hopefully avoid embarrassing accidents. I mean, they were doing everything they could do to help her, you know, remain, keep her dignity and not have those accidents. Um, however, what that did is now every time she saw it, she wanted to use it. So it was triggering her to wanting to see it. So the simple fix there was to simply move the commode a few feet away where it was out of eyesight. So when she did have an urge to go, she got up, she could find it quickly. So that, you know, that was a simple fix and they had to, they, they went through a couple of different iterations on how to, you know, maximize the success, if, if you will. Um, and so that's a way, a good way for people. You have to stay creative and keep looking for the right solutions. Now some triggers such as this example are easily remedied while others will take considerable observation, analysis, creativity, and empathy. And you have to, you know, again, you have to really keep trying. But it's key to identify the trigger or triggers. You know, what, what is really causing this behavior? And that's not easy by no means. I mean, sometimes it's easy. The new, new person comes in the room and instantly mom's agitated or something and you pick up on that. But, but other times, I, I, another example I read was when a man would have guests over to visit with his wife and they always came over like at two o'clock in the afternoon and they always sat in the same spots and, and she, his wife would jump up and walk over and smack one of the guests in the forehead. And she, they thought that was an aggressive and, and hurtful kind of thing. But he finally started being a dementia detective, as um, Susan McCauley calls it, and, and term, figured out that what was happening at a certain time of day, there was light reflecting off this person's forehead. And so she was going over and trying to, I don't know, possibly kill a bug or remedy the spot on the head. Um, so, but he, so he was able to remedy that, remedy that and adjust the blinds or something or seating so that wouldn't happen in the future. But, but many people would have labeled her as combative, um, mean person, and, and possibly turned to antipsychotics when it was a simple fix. So, you know, these, again, these are simple kind of things, and I know it's never this simple. Um, but whether you're helping a family care, you know, family care for a loved one at a home or you're helping residents in a care home, you know, becoming that dementia detective is a skill that you really need to develop. And um, really what you've got to do is you want to start by observing the surroundings. You have to, I know, I know as a care partner, caregiver, it's so hard to slow down and observe because you're so in the throes of things. But you need to pay attention to the noises, the sounds, air temperature, people, the demeanor of those around them. That includes you, the caregiver. If you're carrying a load of stress, that stress, it, 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 it radiates. And, you know, um, I know my wife and I do it to each other. We get stressed about things, and the next thing I know, you know, I've got her stressed or she's got me stressed. So those emotions um, definitely... Um, carry over to other people and it's really hard and we got to really try to watch that. Um, but note anything that may be affecting them. Um, behaviors often repeat in dementia care so you want to try to start keeping a log and of what you've observed. Logs are great because you know so many care partners, caregivers, they you know you need to, journaling is a great great outlet and and logging things because once you log something by you know you note the day of time time of day, you know, note what they're doing, who they're with, what they ingested, what kind of food, medications, liquids, etc. You'll start to see trends. You'll start to see that commonality. 
and if you know you look for those patterns and you know discuss that information with other people and and hopefully you can you know key in on what's triggering it and you can alter or improve something in their environment to avoid the behavior altogether you know and also if you're caring for someone that's not an immediate family member that you've known forever um, it's great to review the individual's profile you know it to, that helps you better understand their likes and dislikes um, and even if you are a family you know a close family member it's great to create one of these profiles for for care for professionals who are trying to help your loved one I, I know when I volunteer at the adult day center and um, a daughter brings her mom in, brought her mom in for the first time, and you know her mom didn't want to be locked in that room with us, and she wanted to get out. But the daughter handed me this profile, and it instantly empowered me to know that she, her mom was had been a school teacher. And with that little bit of information, I was able to talk to her on something that was near and dear to her heart, and it eased her agitation and desire to get out. Now I'm not saying it totally eliminated her desire to get out, but it definitely made it a much more comfortable situation. So understanding their likes, their dislikes is um, extremely valuable. Also if you have, you know, if you know their life history, um, what their, what their, their jobs were, uh, in the past, what, what, what experiences they had. Oftentimes that also is part of the dementia detective investigation. Um, Susan McCauley of um, My Alzheimer's Story just recently shared a story about um, a person who was in a care home and would ripped off, literally ripped the sink off the wall and um, turns out that he used to be a construction worker and, and demolition and Im making improvements were probably his his um, you know role so it was really you know f putting that together understanding that and and then and then taking advantage of all that energy and that desire to help giving him a role in the in the facility the care home giving him stuff to make him feel like he is the handy you know let him be the handyman let him let him you know take part in fixing and helping repair things um, the local care community here where they have a an ex FBI um, employee and he is their security guard and he you know every time I go he helps me you know when we protect my security and we walk around and check the security of the of the community a little bit so understanding their past really helps so taking the time to understand how the environment is affecting the person with dementia is essential to creating what I call a dementia friendly home where the triggers have been minimized and hopefully undesirable emotions and behaviors can be avoided altogether and and minimized when you know, when not totally avoided because we're never going to avoid them all it's just too complicated of a disease but but when you do you're going to feel fewer undesirable behaviors everyone's well-being will benefit and you will avoid potential crises and I really believe you ought to take these steps to, to, to do this so that your relationships can stay strong because this time is so valuable for you to, to be together, to be loving, and to, to, to just get to be a happy family. So, yeah, so, so Chris, some of the undesirable behaviors or actions that, you know, we hear about often are, you know, anger and aggression. Um, again, the, a lot of times the anger comes from maybe being confined and restricted from doing something. They've, they've lost, they've been independent all their lives, able to care for themselves all their lives, and now we're restricting them. Or, or, or it comes from frustration because um, you know they used to be able to do things and now they can't do it so I know if I get frustrated I can become a little grumpy at times um, and I am sure I'm not alone there so um, anger and frustration the 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 need to use the bathroom or go outside because some, we see something that triggers something um, you know the the there's so many different examples of um, undesirable behaviors and so many of them can't be um, there's just a long list and uh, but so in the other in other trainings I talk about the four elements of the home you want to focus on 
and they all work together to create an environment that 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 helps your loved one thrive and this includes the safety of the home which of course is at the top of our list because by having a safe home then as a care partner you feel better when you're allowing them to move about the home maybe even being able to go outside on their own if you have a you know um, there's security features I talk about ways to get to that but if they're if you don't have to have your eye on them all the time then they can be, be independent move about and you can get stuff done as well and then there's function I call function function is where the home actually meets your needs it's more like the you know can I reach the glasses on the shelf can I easily find the peanut butter is there a work area for me the school teacher or the engineer for instance to have for them to have a desk is something they always had so for them to have a personal space in the home that is theirs with their books with their stuff is very important to help them feel fulfilled feel purposeful and um, have a place to tinker around I, I know if I have a desk with whether I open the books or not you know if I have if I saw my physics books my calculus books all these books that I can't even read now um, it would probably be more comforting to me so function is about that home working to meet that individual's needs and it also goes over for the care partner is there easy way to wash clothes if they become soiled is there easy ways to get to items that, that we need in our caregiving you know, daily caregiving needs and or are we always climbing a ladder and putting ourselves at risk we want to make the home functional and we want to have stimulation we want to have enriching so number three is stimulation and we want to have enriching purposeful activities we want to avoid that boredom that because again that boredom is one of the number one causes of of getting into trouble if you will and um, you know, I recently posted a great example on, on the Together in This page and my personal page of Heather of Creative Care where she works with her mom to create paper, flowers, and all kinds of different art projects. Now, that's what works for Heather's mom, and you have to find what works for your loved one. It, it could be a woodworker who um, used to... to you know do woodworking <laughs> and and now they can't so you know maybe it's just giving them a piece of wood and some sandpaper maybe you go to the thrift store and buy a cheap piece of wood and furniture they can sand on and you guys can together refinish it later or, or something it really depends everything depends on the person's level of abilities and where they're at in the disease so if we can focus on making a home safer to help them stay independent functional to help them have successful outcomes by finding things, by reaching things, by completing activities of daily living, and then by having stimulation. Stimulation, we can we can really help avoid and eliminate many of the triggers that lead to behavioral issues. So, uh, don't mean to be ignoring you, Chris, but. Um, I appreciate you commenting. Are there are there differences in mild, moderate, and severe stages? There are absolutely are differences, and I, I really try not to focus on the stages as much as the person's abilities, because we want to we want to turn our focus from looking at decline to looking at what remains. What abilities can we harness? What can we really get them to help them still do and complete successfully? And you know maybe with our help, um, but silently, not never pointing out mistakes. So, so there are differences, and every person's different, and every caregiver's diff family's different. So, um, and your mom goes to the bathroom every hour, and that is a very common common problem um, because they go whether they need to or not sometimes. So maybe there's something in the environment triggering triggering her. Maybe she's um, there's all kinds of different things. Um, my little cat um, thinks I'm talking to her, so if you hear her meowing, um, yeah, stimulation can definitely be a tough one, definitely. And um, how do we thrive in bringing up children in this environment? It's hard to keep things calm 24/7, and it creates agitation. It is very, it does does complicate, and um, I think it's probably a much easier situation at times when it's just a one-on-one -on -one situation. Because anytime you bring in other family members, no matter what their age, um, it brings in other dynamics. 
and it brings in other levels of empathy or no empathy. Um, it brings in other people's life problems and, and how they want to deal with things. My cat wants to join, so we're going to let her into the picture. She doesn't understand why I'm ignoring her. So, um, so, um, so yeah, it's it's really hard, and it really depends on the age of the children. But you, you know, the, and it's easier said than done again. But you really want to try to, you know, communicate with the children about what's going on, um, um, keep them involved, let them he help when they can, let them just be children when they can. Um, and you know, really just talk to them about what's going on with with your loved one, and it, it's it's really really a hard situation. Um, so, but I do really believe that. And if you if you know if anyone wants to email me or contact me afterwards, I can try to provide you a little bit more um, solid or in depth answer. It's it's really hard not knowing each person's individual situation or where your loved one is with the disease or your family is. So um, tend to have to kind of broad stroke and generalize in, in these kind of discussions. Um, it's just because it's, just, cause it's no black, it's not black and white as everybody knows. So, but, but again, if you can focus on improvements to the home which reduce these triggers, everybody's well-being is going to be better. And I truly believe um, it's going to protect the health of everybody and potentially slow decline. You know, we really want to avoid, you know, it's that purpose in life. It's that, that love, that feeling that, that keeps us wanting to live, wanting to keep us fighting back. And, you know, again, with 80% of people being cared for at home, um, only 20% of our, of our dementia family, if you will, are, are getting care in a care facility. And, you know, and... and some of those care facilities are much better than others, of course. So, um, but it's our goal to, always, you know, be maximizing the care. So I'm, um, I'm also want to announce. I'm going to go ahead and wrap up. We're about the 30-minute mark. Um, I do want to announce that I've created a new Facebook group for anybody that's really, you know, interested in um, learning more specifics about. Um, home improvements, pr improvements to the home, I'd rather say, um, then that's going to be a group I'm creating so we can focus on that as opposed to some of the other, you know, cures or news stories or um, we're going to, this is going to be totally focused more on that safety function, stimulation and triggers. So if you, you know, I just created the group so we have no members, I'd look, love to have you join and let's, you know, create a thriving community. Also, if um, I have a couple other items here, I do appreciate everybody being here. I love this ability to be able to reach out and come together as a, a dementia family and, and share resources and, and all. I do have a checklist also that can possibly, you know, you can look it over and help get some more ideas about um, how to, how to um, make improvements to the home. And um, I had another link I meant to provide. I'm providing a lot of links here, I know, but um, just want to make sure everybody gets the resources they need because um, it's so important, so important that we find ways and we keep staying creative and persistent. It's that persistence and, um, and creativity. So I'm going to add a link in a minute when my browser will start working, but I would like to thank everyone for being here. If you haven't, be sure to like my page and stop by togetherness and sign up for my newsletter or other resources so we can stay in touch and I can keep providing you with, with great information. And um, so with that, everybody, I appreciate it and bye-bye. Um,